What's up, everybody? Greetings from Warsaw, Indiana, not to be confused with Warsaw, Poland. It's Caleb here. Matthew's here as well. Matthew, you want to pop in and just wave and say hi and show your, your pretty mug? Damn it. There we go. What's going on, everyone? Putting him on the spot. So we, Matthew and I had a breakup. We're no longer together in Colorado. We got as far away from each other as we could, nearly. So Matthew <laughs> has been... Uh, Tell them a little bit. I know a lot of people have yeah. heard your story, but what have you been up to the last couple of months? Yeah, so we um, had a lease at a house in Colorado and we knew we wanted to buy a house next, but we weren't sure where yet. So we decided instead of renewing a lease for a whole nother year that sends uh, everything we do, we can do from the internet and work from the road, that we'd buy a fifth wheel and go travel around for a while. So we've been traveling around in a fifth wheel for the past, uh, it was seven months almost, like just about seven months. And we just called the end of it. We got a short term uh, rental here in Arizona until uh, our house is done in a couple months from now. But yeah, so now I'm back. I'm not back. I'm in Arizona for the first time. Um, and then Caleb, like you said, is in Indiana now. So Scout IQ is no longer officially headquartered in Denver, Colorado area. It, it, was, a, it was a great time for us, though. I mean, for tax reasons, we are. But uh, yeah, Fair I'll say that. <laughs> Haven't gotten around to changing LLCs. But yeah. Uh, at any point, um, you guys, if you're watching us on YouTube, I guess smash that like button, whatever the gurus tell you to do. Hit that like button, drop a comment, let us know where you're from. We can see all the comments as well. We're actually pulling in from our Facebook group as well as on YouTube. So go ahead and drop some comments. If you have questions, drop those as well. Say hello, um, hit like, don't hit unsubscribe, all that good stuff. But uh, I'm back in Indiana. Matthew, as he said, is going to be settling in in Arizona. I know a lot of you have um, tried to reach out to either of us and asked if we're uh, in Colorado because you're traveling and wanted to come see the office or hit up Top Golf, and we're no longer there. So this is now our official notice that we have separated into different areas. We're still together. I did have a couple people email me. I think Matthew, I shared the email, but someone asked if I was like no longer part of the company because all I saw was you. Uh, doing stuff, and they were curious if I, I guess, got kicked out or sold my shares or something. But uh, that yeah, is there, there, there is a video. I said I'm an, an owner of eFlip Scout IQ and New Price, and people took that as the owner instead of an owner. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of fun. I was like, man, if I, if I got bought out, I don't see a big chunk of money in my bank account. So uh, we'll have to figure that one out later. And what some of you might not know is there's actually a third silent business partner that's secretly in the background of all these videos. He's invisible. He's right here. He's my friend. But no, there's another, we have another fella actually in Missouri or Missouri as the locals say. So we, uh, we are now in Arizona, Missouri and Indiana here to serve you. If you're ever in the Warsaw, Indiana area, it's about two hours north of Indianapolis, an hour west of Fort Wayne, an hour south of South Bend. Hit us up. Well, hit me up. Matthew won't be here, although from time to time he'll drop in. So uh, COVID's been weird. We're in kind of a weird time with the election as well. I'm just going to not get political, but I will say it's really embarrassing that as one of the most technological countries, if not the most technological, we haven't figured out how to count. So whichever way the election ends up, I just hope that uh, the American people feel like it's a fair honest situation and it's kind of silly i've seen all these memes that chick-fil-a should be running the election and i tend to agree it's just silly that in the 21st century we can't actually figure out a way to let everybody vote count them feel good about the decision and move on and that's all i'm going to say so at any point i wanted to give you a little walkthrough of a kind of a warehouse space that i got set up in indiana walk you through how i found it kind of kind of what i'm thinking why do i have books on my shelves somebody asked I've been a staunch proponent of FBA for very long and uh, pretty much forever. I started Merchant Fulfilled and switched to FBA and have been FBA for five years. And I really believed in that as I was traveling, uh, did not want to have a ton of books in my house. But for a number of reasons, COVID being one of them, Merchant Fulfilled is starting to play a role in my business. And I'm going to share some of that as well. I'd like to take some of your questions. I've been trying to madly clean up the warehouse space and I'll give you guys a quick tour here. It's nothing crazy. It's nothing huge. Uh, but it's home and I like it. So I'll give you a little walkthrough. This is by all means not beautiful. I'm hopeful, hopefully it's presentable and I'll kind of show you what we got going on. And I want to talk through kind of my thoughts as I'm trying to hire people, set up a workflow. For those of you that do have warehouses and do have space and are trying to set things up, hopefully you can pick up uh, uh, some really good information here. And again, I'm by no means an expert. 
I would love, I've seen, I've seen several of your warehouses as well and I've been blown away and sometimes I've not been blown away, but usually I'm blown away by the efficiency and the order that you've set up. So uh, by all means, call me out on stuff. I know I'm not being as efficient as I can and kind of my philosophy, I've talked about this a bit, but when it comes to business, as you're trying to, to grow things, you got to figure out where do you add value to the equation and try and outsource and hire people where you don't add the most value and do the things that, that do provide the most value. And along those lines, when it comes to hiring people, my goal here is I'm trying to pay employees and contractors as much as I possibly can. There's two schools of thought when it comes to hiring. One is pay as little as you can and just get replaceable people. Doesn't matter if they last uh, you know, two weeks or two months or two years. When they churn or fall out, you just go replace them with the next cheapest source of labor. Or you can try and say, I'm gonna optimize the business and try and pe pay people as much as I possibly can. What that does is hopefully get people to stick around longer, get a little more loyalty. And my job as the business owner is to set up all of these processes that I'm going to show you to be quick uh, functional, make sure we're not you know, making mistakes and then make sure that it's efficient because if we can get through 300 books an hour when it comes to listing versus 150 or 100, that means I can touch more books an hour. My per cost labor per book labor goes down. And if I want, that's more profit for me. Or in my case, I'd rather pay my employees more and get them to stick around as well. Matthew's throwing notes up quick and efficient are pretty much the same thing, but, uh, yeah, at any point, well, I digress. So let me show you a little tour, walk around. I know that's why most of you are here. And again, if you do have questions, we'll answer some of those. I think I can just click on them. Is that right, Matthew? So we'll, um, I can try that a little bit. Uh, yeah, click on and pop up on the screen. Mm, maybe not for me. I don't have power, but that's all right. At any point, I'll, uh, I'll just read some of them. We've got people <laughs> saying misery. Uh, Gary from Vegas, Marla in uh, Arizona, she's in Scottsdale. We got Andrea also in Colorado, James in Denver, Sean from Utah, Matt from Phoenix. There's two Matts in Phoenix. This is going to be confusing. Uh, what part of Indiana? Warsaw, North Central. And uh, a Facebook user says, what's up, p -p 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 Caleb? So I don't I don't get it. But at any point, let me show you. There we go. I'll, uh, I'll walk you through just a little bit again. Still very much putting things together. I'm gonna try not to make you go dizzy. Let's see if I can flip this around. And we got some shelves and I'll uh, kind, of, kind of explain what we got going on. So this will look like Blair Witch Project. And uh, let me just show you from outside and kind of show you what the city looks like here. I'm not downtown Warsaw, but I'm kind of close. Just got some streets over here if the camera can adjust. There we go. So uh, it's a beautiful day. It's almost 70 degrees here in Indiana. Uh, I got some cars set up and I got some freight waiting to go out. So if I do have to duck out right in the middle of this, I've got a couple pallets coming in freight. If any of you worked in freight, realize it's almost always late. So this is the, the lovely view I get to come into every morning, walk into the warehouse and boom. So uh, it's basically just a concrete slab. There's not really any heat or uh, AC or anything like that. I've got a couple windows and that's about it. And some beautiful fluorescent lights, which we'll hopefully swap out for LED. So I've set up my space. I've got room for about 18,000 books. Uh, Merchant Fulfilled, I'll kind of show you what I do there in a minute. I bought these crates from Uline. They're really overkill, but wood prices are insanely high right now. So I've got these tables on wheels. You guys might have seen these back from the Colorado uh, location. These are awesome, but wood is just so expensive right now that these would cost probably three or 400 bucks to build. I was going to build some cages like these, and instead I got them from Uline. I think they're 300 bucks. And I got some cool casters underneath that are about 25 bucks from Amazon. So these can hold uh, well over you know, a couple thousand pounds. They're basically a Gaylord box, but in cage form. The sides flip down. They've actually flipped halfway down and then all the way down so you can get in there. And uh, these are pretty cool for moving books around and trying to keep things somewhat organized. And no, Bill, if you're watching this from Sell Back Your Book, I'm not shipping these to you. Get your own. You can afford it. Um, if you guys remember the Scout IQ office, I've got that set up here. If you guys know me, I'm, I'm uh, a little obsessed with golf. This may turn into a golf simulator. So if you're ever in Warsaw, come visit, come check it out. For now, we've got the lovely orange pillows from our Scout IQ office and uh, a little setup area. So uh, I'll be watching TV, listing books, and uh, no employees in here today. They're uh, actually off hitting their own library sales because they like running their own business. So the general goal, so I, I paid for this. Uh, I'm not real shy when it comes to most things. So if you have questions, just ask. 
Um, I do have a killer deal on this. I was looking around for warehouse space and most of it was in the uh, maybe 1500 to $2,500 range for two to 3000 square feet. I think this is just over 1500, about 1800 if I re recall. And that's a local business guy. He bought the, the whole building. The building is actually like three different parts. So I'm renting this for now. I'm going to get access over here as well. I see some other books kind of set up and he's got some cars in storage. So I'm hopefully not hitting those with my pallet jack. This does have a, a dock, kind of a weird story though. It doesn't go anywhere. See the dock here and it actually goes outside. Trucks can back up into it. It holds about four pallets, but there's no way to get the books off without a, a pallet jack or a, a pallet walker. I'm going to be buying a pallet walker, which is an electric poor man's version of a forklift. And I'll show you guys that once it shows up. So the general idea is I'll eventually get all of this space as well. I'm paying 600 a month for everything over here, which is a killer deal. The guy uh, actually sold me my first house and uh, he's a retired business guy in the area. Super nice. And uh, Bruce, if you ever watch this, thank you very much for taking good care of us. So we got some tables set up. So the general goal is stuff's going to come in the door here. Let me show you before I do that. Let me show you this. We work with um, consignment clients. We work with different partners all over and uh, hopefully none of these sources give anything away, but I'm kind of doing a color coded system here. So I've got inbound shipping, you know, I've got uh, two on their way from Colorado, four on their way from Brad. Once they arrive, we'll move those. So everything here will have the same colors, right? Once they arrive, we, we check them in and we make sure that we color them. And I'll show you what we do there. And then in processing, we try and track everything through the system so that we pay people accordingly and we just know our metrics. So we got eight pallets uh, that we're working on currently along with four from Mac. And then we finished two this week and actually got two pallets out the door to FBA. So kind of tracking things through the process. We work with some smaller clients that don't send us pallets. And again, I should probably mention in the bulk world here, I'm not taking in raw books. That's not the way I wanna run the business. We're letting people scan essentially with Scout IQ and they, they send us the winners or um, we'll go pick them up or whatever it is. And then we're kind of processing them here. So we're optimizing our business. There's very little waste. I don't have, you know, 70, 80 percent dud rates like traditional bulk. And I also don't have space really to handle a bulk operation. And so you, uh, that's not really what I want to run with it. So I'll show you kind of the workflows here. If you're doing bulk, you'll just have a more of a, a refuse or recycling stream that comes out of that. Um, and if you're not doing either, hopefully you can pick up some tips on efficiency. So color wise, Holy Family is green. It's, you know, got eight skids kind of meandering around. I mark everything on these pallets. So Holy Families are all books from there. I was using stickies, but I decided I'd get fancy and use laminated construction paper because, you know, why not? So these books then will come in and get scans over here. So the main goal is I want stuff to go in a circle. It just makes sense in my mind. I don't know if that's the most efficient, but stuff's going to come in through here. What's going to happen is ideally once these cars are out in a month or two, I'll have access to this space and I'm going to bring all my inbound stuff here and it's just going to set and I can stack it on top of each other if it's Gaylords or whatnot. So I should have a lot of room to grow the operation from here. And uh, what will happen is the books will come in. And again, here's you know pallets that came in. So there's you know pink is Addison, and yellow is Brad. So from that standpoint, I just want to make sure that I'm tracking everything that comes in the door. And there's some more cars over there for anybody that's into cars. Um, so what happens is ideally nothing touches the floor, but we had a bunch of stuff come in, not in boxes, which was not ideal. And so what'll happen is we take it here, load it onto these tables on wheels, make sure we mark it. So it's green, holy family. We know it's coming in the door. What'll happen is we'll wheel it in here and we're either going to move our, our scanning station right into this area or we'll leave it over here. I'm not quite sure yet, but the circle starts over here. We'll set the books up on table, set it over to here. We're going to scan them essentially with Scout IQ. It's a little bit more of a bulked up version. If you guys are doing bulk books, reach out, drop me a line, Caleb at thebookflipper.com. We're kind of toying around. It's something I built for myself and uh, it's kind of a cool bulk tool. So if you are doing bulk, it's a little bit of a premium version of Scout IQ and uh, helps you kind of just sort through books quicker, more efficiently and uh, drop me an email and I'll, I'll be happy to show you a little bit more. We're not really uh, sharing that publicly at this point. Can't really give you a demo and don't really want to get into software discussions here. I'm not going to get into all the nit nitty gritty of listing and, and repricing and all that. Happy to answer some questions, but I just want to walk through workflows essentially. So books are going to come in here. We sort them really, they go six ways. So the six ways that they go is one is going to be FBA. 
So we take all the FBA books and we pile them in here and I'm pretty sure this should be labeled if I did my job right. And there it is. So these come in and these are FBA books ready to get listed FBA. They're going to then get moved over. We're going to set up some stations over here and we're going to list FBA here, Merchant Fulfilled around the corner. And we'll probably have an outbound station for Merchant Fulfilled as well. So we go stop one is FBA. Stop two, Merchant Fulfilled. So they're going to go here. And again, they'll probably pop up into a station over here. We also have two wholesalers. So Bill, sell back your book, SBYB, all of uh, the stuff that we can't use or that uh, we brought in the door knowing that they could use it goes into one of their Gaylords. And we've got another client, very similar to sell back. Uh, they buy some different material as well. And so we're able to kind of route stuff. Um, so two stops go to Amazon, two stops go to buyback companies. And then we have two more stops. One is uh, Duds. They end up back in these bins here. Actually had dinner with a bookstore owner last night. Um, and he's probably going to take all of our duds. I hate to throw books away. They're going to end up in a recycler anyway. So they kind of get turned into toilet paper. But I'm either going to find a way to give them away to the community, kind of have a free book stop on Fridays. People can drop off, you know, trade some books out. Maybe I'll get some good books that way. Um, but duds go in here. And I think I'm going to get a bookstore owner to come in the door and take some of it. And the worst books, type ins. So anything that's a type in doesn't have a barcode. We're going to have to type these in, use OCR on uh, Scout IQ. Uh, you'll see a lot of books like this that have uh, like a UPC. The camera can focus there. A lot of these do have ISBNs behind the cover. This is kind of like a secret. It's not really a secret, but inside the cover will be a scannable ISBN. But uh, those kind of go in the type in pile so that we don't have people scan the wrong items. And you see we got a lot of these. So we try not to get these in the door. But usually these are still pre-scanned. There should be a lot of value in here. And we've got to do the work to type them in, put a barcode on them, and then pass them through the stream. So the six, six stops for us, again, are FBA, Merchant Fulfilled. Those go in these bins. The wholesalers, the buyback companies, we've got two of those. We've got a couple more as well, but pretty much two that handle the bulk side of the business. And then we've got... Um, Type ins, which is, I don't know, we'll have to find a way to say that if you're the last person in on a Monday morning, you get to do type ins all week and then duds. So that's the nature of the business. What's going to happen then is from these bins, we go over to the tables, we pretty much pull them out. So we try and leave everything barcode up, makes it just easier to work with along the way. What we're going to do then is we're going to grade these. So we're going to pretty much, uh, I only list acceptable good and very good. I saw some of you had some questions on new and like new. I don't do that. If you bought them brand new from a publisher or a distributor and you have invoices and can fight that battle, by all means do it. Um, it kind of comes up in the groups. Amazon does some sting operations from time to time and shuts people down or, or suspends them for a bit for selling new books. Um, a lot of books might look new. You know, library books for me only go good or, or uh, acceptable. I don't do library books anything better than good. But uh, I know a lot of you will see a book and go, man, here's, here's probably a decent one. You know, no one's ever read this, right? It hasn't even been cracked. The, the dust jacket's pristine. I know there's guys out there that make a whole business model of just running that business. They might shrink wrap them. They might leave them alone. And, you know, this book literally is, except for that letter in the front page, has never been read. I know some of you out there might sell it new because used, it might be, a, you know, a $10 book and new, it might be a $25 book. So I get the desire to do it. I don't play the game. I'm always playing a long game and I don't want to get suspended or shut down over trying to make a couple extra dollars. So that's that's my philosophy. Um, but books are gonna get graded. And what we do is acceptable goes in the front. So we make three piles. Acceptable goes here, good, and then very good. And then what happens is, again, I wanna pay my employees well, but I also want them to be replaceable from the standpoint of, if you only wanna work a couple hours a week or 10 hours a week or whatever, if you come in the door, you can easily see, this is the source, here's what, you know, what it is, this is the FBA station. These are already on the table and the sticker is going to be up here as well or the tag. So they know exactly what they're doing and they can jump in where somebody else left off. So my job is to set up systems, make sure that there's SOP, you know, standard operating procedures so people know exactly what they're doing. And I want to make it where people can come in and they see their priorities really clearly. And uh, hopefully in a week or two or three, this will even be tidier than it is because this has been a wreck. It's a slightly bearable wreck, but it's, uh, it's still a wreck. So FBA is going to get processed here. It'll get listed, labeled, put into boxes, put onto pallets. I'm shipping two pallets uh, out today. So again, if I have to leave in the middle of this real quick, freight might show up. Um, two pallets to ship 
is 1900 books. So it's about a thousand books a pallet. Cost me $50 a pallet to ship it to Amazon. So the, the freight savings, um, that's really the only way to save money when it comes to FBA. It doesn't matter if you're sell back your book or thrift books or discover or any of the big players. If you're doing FBA, they're paying the same rates and the same fees as us small players. And there's really no way to get any kind of economies of scale as it relates to like merchant fulfilled. If you ship, if you're willing to pre-sort, you can negotiate and get really good rates and you can actually save about a dollar off of media mail rates, which means that a book that I can sell and make 50 cents and I probably go, eh, it's not worth the, the labor and the, the storage and everything else. Those guys are making a dollar 50. In some cases, even more, it just depends on where it's shipping. So FBA, there's really no way to get an advantage outside of lowering your labor cost to touch a book and shipping it on pallets. So pallets really save you money when it comes to FBA. Merchant Fulfilled, let me show you this real quick and then we'll, I'll kind of sit back down and stop making y'all dizzy. Merchant Fulfilled is gonna get set up here. It's got a bunch of mail, like poly mailers and uh, bubble mailers and everything else that's going to get set up. What's gonna happen here is same thing. We're gonna grade them uh, good, acceptable, very good on the table. They're gonna get listed. We use thermal receipt paper. I'm still waiting on Acceler List. Travis, come on, man. Let's get some, uh, let, me, let me back up a second. Let's get some uh, Merchant Fulfilled tickets going. But uh, so I'm using Scan Lister right now. Um, Nathan and, and his team are doing a good job there. But uh, Travis, I'd love to love to use Acceler List for Merchant Fulfilled. That's my plug. So anyway, what we're gonna do is uh, I got the shelves set up. I still got some personal items down this shelf. Probably a fire hazard. Don't tell anybody. What's gonna happen is over here is gonna be A. The next one over is gonna be B, C, D. So both sides of this are gonna be C, D, E, F, G, H, right? So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Yes, I know my letters. What's gonna happen then is those are the uh, like the uh, aisles. So I'll put labels on these so employees can find them. It's not too hard with only four main shelves. What's gonna happen then is as we go down, you see these like three foot sections. So these are bays. These are gonna be individual bays and I'll have numbers on the floor that let us see exactly what those are. Apologies as we get dizzy back here. But what's gonna happen is bay one is gonna be all the way at the back. So this is the B side, this is B and then one, and then we've got everything labeled all the way down here. And what's gonna happen is as these sell, I don't actually mark which shelf they're on. It's not that important, reason being, so this is shelf two. The SKUs say B2, so I'll be bay two, and then just random incrementing numbers, so 43, 44, 45, so on and so forth. As they sell, we'll squish them over and we'll push them up to the top. And the reason I'm going up to the top, I think Bill says go push them down to the bottom. You can start with one down here and work your way over and up. And then as they sell, your really long tail stuff or the stuff that doesn't sell gets pushed all the way to the bottom. You could do it this way because these shelves are about seven-ish, seven and a half feet tall. Kind of high, I'll make it look really tall. There we go. Because these shelves are tall, I'm gonna let the old stuff go to the top. And then what's going to happen is over time, we'll come back in and kind of clear some of those books out as they sell. And we'll just know they're old and crusty. And then I've got a four digit number. So if you're uh, if you're a thinker, we can actually get up to 9,999. We don't include zero. So basically 10,000 books we can get on this bay. Um, if you guys know how to calculate the number of books that fit in an area, it's basically a book an inch. So we've got three feet. These are three foot bays. So that's basically 36 books per shelf. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times 36 gets us somewhere in the ballpark of 220 to 230. And how we do? There is 227, 4, 27, 220. It's about 230. So each shelf roughly holds 250, which means I have capacity for close to 18,000 books. And then as these turn, these go quickly. So I'll kind of talk through why I'm doing some merchant fulfills. Um, and none of this is live right now. It's all in vacation mode. You're welcome to look up titles, but they, uh, you won't find my account from that. So good luck. Um, so we've got, you know, shelf bay two, bay three. And again, it's really easy to tell. You just go to B3 on the SKU. When the book sells, this is actually baked into the SKU and we'll be able to go in and just find the book quickly. I'll get a library cart going up and down the aisles. We'll pick all the A's, all the B's, all the C's, bring them out and uh, that'll be fun. So I've got about... I don't know, 2,000, 2,500 books listed right now. Uh, I'm going to wait till we have about everything in here probably listed. So six or eight or 10,000 merchant fulfilled books. And then we're going to flip a switch, go off vacation mode, and we'll see how many sell. And I'll show you that process once they go. So that's essentially it. Again, it's a circle, circle of life, circle of books. Books are going to come in here. 
We're going to put them on carts, wheel them back over to here, sort them into FBA merchant fulfilled wholesalers. And then we're going to uh, circle them around, prep them, get them listed. FBA will actually go and go back out that way and freight will come and get it. And merchant fulfilled will end up on these shelves until they sell. So now that I've made you dizzy, let's go sit back down and uh, I'll kind of look at the questions. Matthew, if you see any good questions, we'll kind of jump into that. And then I'm happy to explain, you know, how do I do merchant fulfilled FBA, what the benefits are, and what should you, what should you be thinking about as you want to get into bulk or kind of doing these as well. All right, let me get a drink. I've been yakking. Hopefully y'all can still see me, but uh, whew, that's all I got. Matthew, how are we doing? All right, I see some questions. Let me let me catch up and uh, kind of look through and see what we got. And uh, I'll stick around. I only talked for 25 minutes, so we'll stick around. We can ask Matthew to tell some jokes. Uh, we can answer your questions. And again, we want to make this valuable for you. So we're going to let you guys drive and direct the discussion at this point, and we'll go from there. So Craig says, do we have data about total overall used book sales on Amazon? What have the latest months of the pandemic done to Q4 sales so far compared to 2019, for example? There's not a lot of great data on the overall market. Uh, E-commerce has a number of tailwinds, which is corporate speak for really good things helping push you along. Um, so e-commerce in general, and this is kind of a surprising stat if you don't know it, I guess the question is what percent of total retail in the US do you guys think is done online? You guys drop some uh, questions in there. Uh, drop some answers, leave a comment in on the Facebook group or on YouTube. We'll see if anybody's close. What percent of total retail in the U.S. is being done online or e-commerce at the moment? Actually, pre-COVID. Let's see what we got. I don't know if, Matthew, you can put a, a poll question together or something there. All right, someone says 47 percent. Let's see what else we got. What do you guys think? 40%, 35%, 63%, very specific. 39, 15, 39, 70. So we got a lot, a lot of answers coming in. The answer more or less was actually right around 10% at the end of last year. So it's shockingly low. Again, we think everybody's on Amazon, everybody's just buying stuff online. But when it comes even to groceries and everything else, it's being purchased from a retail environment. So Brian Greenway, Nicely done. I think you were the closest of the answers I saw, but uh, it's about 10%. We're going to see that roughly double. We're seeing that climb a lot. So for anything to double in a year is pretty impressive, especially when you're talking about national buying trends, but we're going to see that get up closer to 20%. And so Amazon is roughly 50% of e-commerce. I think they're more than 50% of, of book sales. And so of course, anything that we're selling online is going to get that same bump as well. So I know several of you that run bulk operations much larger than my small operation here. And uh, I know you're very excited and very bullish about the, uh, about everything that's coming in. Uh, that may be freight as well. I guess if they show up, hold on one second, Matthew, throw, throw another question up there real quick. Sorry. All right. Let me get one question up here. Am I muted? Yeah, I think I'm unmuted. All right, let's see here. So one of the questions that was asked the most, let me find it right here, actually had to do with Keepa. A ton of you guys asked about Keepa, how to read Keepa, what Keepa meant. I saw a few comments from people saying that they've been selling books for a long time and they never use Keepa. What's the point of it? So we actually did, Caleb did a long video on Keepa where he talked about all of this stuff. And so I put a bit.ly link together. You can see the bottom of the screen. I think it was like an hour of training. So if you guys want to see, an hour in-depth thing. Caleb's breaking down a lot of different Keepa charts, Keepa graphs. He's showing you exactly how to read it and what the purpose of it is and how to use it in your business. Check out that training right there. I'll leave the link up for a few minutes because um, that will answer all the questions way better than we could in like a two-minute answer segment right here. Sweet. All right. It was, uh, it was a political call. I think they missed a boat to, or they missed a vote, whatever. But anyway, freight might be coming later. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so in general, e-commerce, we're seeing it roughly double this year, which means that's a really nice upside for anybody that's selling online. And again, it's, it is a little shocking because we're so used to selling and being part of the e-commerce equation. And we think kind of it's, it's, you know, it's over. Everybody's in it. Everybody's selling and you know, there's not much room for growth. Well, in a general trend, we're only starting to reach that tipping point. I know I sound 
like a guru or like I'm selling something, but we, we've reached a tipping point where e-commerce, especially with COVID, is just going to be continuing to accelerate. So that's a really good spot um, as it relates to our business and everybody that's selling on Amazon. Okay, most effective strategies for conditioning books. Conditioning books is a couple things. One, you could say it's uh, it's the author's intent or Amazon's intent. Right. So you can look at their rules. You should definitely read their guidelines and make sure you're staying in there as well. Um, but what you really should be doing is it's about the reader response. For those of you that don't know, that was a that was, never mind. I won't get into it. That's a theology debate from from college. But at any rate, um, it's less about what Amazon says, although that's important. There's something fun on the Enneagram. It's more about the reader when they get the book. So just because Amazon's guidelines say, hey, maybe I could list this as very good, for example, I'm just giving examples. Um, it's more about when the reader gets the book, if they bought a good a, you know, a good book and it shows up and they're like, man, I, it's kind of beat up a little bit. I'm not real happy with it. That's ultimately what matters. So you should stick with Amazon's guidelines and rules. However, when in doubt, we always downgrade. So the grading process for us is very, very quick. Essentially, what we're doing is we're looking at the book, looking at the outside of it and trying to say, hey, does it look, you know, do I see any obvious water damage or anything really dinged up? I do have a, you know, kind of a, a bent corner, so that's not going to throw into acceptable for me. What I'm doing is pretty much every book is good unless it's pretty much unread and then it gets upgraded to very good. Or if I see, you know, if it's got a ton of markings or anything that's really, you know, damaged then I'm just gonna downgrade to acceptable. So for me, this will be good. And that process takes just a matter of seconds. So it's gonna be looking at a book, looking at the outside. I don't see anything readily wrong with this. I just flip through it quickly, looking for money. I rarely find it. I know many of you post money posts in the group. I think some of them are staged. I don't see a lot of money in books, but uh, maybe I'm just unlucky. This will probably be very good for me. It's like, it's really unread. I don't really see anything in there and uh, it looks perfect. So that'd be very good. So it's going to be really quick in general. It's looking at it and eh, it's a little dingy. Good. So probably the vast majority of our books are going to get listed as good. A handful get upgraded to very good, especially if uh, you know some of our, our clients that send us books, the books are really pretty much unread. And so they're going to be very good. And if they are damaged, even at all, we'll go down to acceptable. A couple caveats. If it's really beat up and I go, man, I wouldn't even like the golden rule. I, you know, I wouldn't want to get this book. So why would I sell it to somebody else? That's a great example, and we toss it to our wholesale partners, sell back your book, and others. Most of them don't care about condition as much. They're happy to sell it, and uh, I'll let their feedback take the hit. They've got ways to sell it and describe it appropriately. So for me, if it's kind of water damage or not that great or a little bit wrinkly or lots of markings, and I'm going, man, I just wouldn't love to get it myself, I either then recycle it or we throw it to sell back your book or somebody else. So Bill, you can have those books. Um, the only caveat is if it is an expensive book, like a textbook, most students don't really care. So if it's a $50 textbook and it's got some water damage, I'm going to list it as acceptable. Say it's super damaged, it's got water damage, and I'm going to list it for $30. And a student that just wants to save money is going to be delighted to get my book. Hopefully no eFlip customers buy it and get mad that it's damaged, but uh, that, that's what it is. Steve says, latest trend, books inactive due to potential high pricing er error. Yep. Uh, Amazon's been doing that for a bit. So I know a lot of you list your books at you know $200 or $500 or $399.98 or something, right? So a lot of you take your books and list them that way and then go back in and, and drop the price later. If you don't catch it right away or once it gets checked into an Amazon facility, Amazon's going to say, hey, this book normally sells for $20 or whatever it sells for. And uh, you got it for $300. It's never sold for that high. And they're going to just say, hey, it's, it's, it's inactive. We're taking it off the table. You can't sell it. What you have to do is either have your repricer go in and reprice it, and then it usually goes back and becomes active. Or sometimes you have to manually go into your inactive or stranded inventory, click on it, change the price, click save, and then move on. So it depends on, on the way it's done it. And usually if you drop that price back into where it normally is, you can use Keepa to figure that out or just look at other current market prices. That will usually help remove that uh, restriction as well. Gene says FBA orders pending for multiple days and weeks. Yeah, that happens. Sometimes it's uh, it's your enemy, other booksellers buying your books and putting them in their carts and putting an invalid credit card in and just letting it sit. That's rare, although there's been lawsuits between fellows in Florida and I believe Chicago. That's kind of a fun story. I don't know the players involved. Uh, 
we should have like a really cool website where people just submit anonymous stories about crazy players. Netflix someday is going to do a documentary on the book selling industry. There's some crazy players in the game. There's just some fun stories, some sad stories. Uh, I think it's made for TV, like storage wars, but book wars. So uh, and anyway, I digress. Uh, where were we going with that? Um, why is it pending for multiple days and weeks? So the FBA orders, it just depends. Usually the payment didn't go through. Maybe there's an invalid address. Typically, Amazon's going to ship those out pretty quickly, and there's not much use you can do to sit in there and worry about it. You know, as Greg Murphy used to say, just go sell more books. So focus on getting more books, getting your systems out the door and get it, you know, work on getting more books going. If it becomes a problem, it's usually on the, on the buyer side. It's not necessarily related to you. Um, and so Amazon's going to take care of it eventually. I'm sure they'd like to move the book and get paid for it as well, just like you would. So they're, you're kind of on the same side there. What's your minimum merchant fulfilled profit or retail price? Uh, I don't look at it prices at all. Reason being is this book, Merchant Fulfilled or FBA, either one, versus this book are very different cost to ship. So Amazon's FBA fees are pretty much based on you know dimensions of the book. So the cubic footage allotment and then the weight uh, for either one. So FBA, the fee on this is going to be like, I forget what they are right now, but like 350 is going to be on the lower ends. And this is probably going to run you about five bucks FBA fees, 475 or whatever it is. So I don't look at list price because this book for $8, you might break even FBA. This book at eight bucks, you might make 250. So it just depends on what that is. So I don't look at retail price. I look at profit. Scout IQ is going to tell you what that, it, it, you know, it knows the dimensions and the weight of all the books as well. It pulls some of that from Amazon. So we, we know exactly what the profit is. And it's a very good question. Um, like a deck of cards, I wish I had a deck of cards here. We get to pick our profit margin. So let's say these pages, every page here is a, a, a tranche or a profit level. Mike Kreider, if you watch this later, you're going to like this analogy. But basically, you've got some books up here, like the cream of the crop, that are really good. Let's say these are $50 and up books. Every bookseller is going to list these books, right? Good rank. It sells a lot. And uh, it's worth you know $50 a profit. We're all going to pull those books and list them. That's not a question. That's just like, duh, we're going to sell these books. The next layer down is, you know, 15 to $20 books. Most of us are going to list those books. Next layer down is like the $10 books or, you know, two or $3 profit. Most of us are still going to list those. Then we kind of get down to the dregs. So typically, you know, 5% of your books are going to be $20 and up. They're really expensive. If you run a really good cherry picking operation, you can optimize and just sell the most expensive books, right? The next layer down, if you're doing bulk, you've got to make some money in the meat of the market here. So maybe this is 10 to 15% of the books you're going to make anywhere from a dollar to, to $5. And a lot of cherry pickers might skip the, uh, the lower end of that in the dollar range or 50 cent range. A lot of bulk players are going to do these books as well. The reason is they already paid for a truckload of books. They've already paid for the labor to scan it. And if they can turn it into 50 cents or 80 cents or a dollar one, they're going to do it. So the question is, how low do you go? And, and you know, we hear a lot of bulk sellers say, hey, um, it's kind of fun. I'm talking in a tunnel. But we see a lot of bulk sellers go, hey, you know, my yield is, is 40 percent or 50 percent. And it's like uh, that's either a really, really good source or you're listing everything where you can make one penny. Right. So if you are willing to, to cut the deck, so to speak, and go down to where you can make a nickel, five cents is your floor profits. One, you're probably still losing money on the labor, but you go, hey, I had to touch it anyway, kind of, and I can list it quickly. So who cares? You might get 40 or 50 percent yield where you're actually listing these books over here and then you're throwing or recycling the rest of the books down here or, or, or getting rid of those somewhere else. So the question is, where do you divide the deck? If you're cherry picking, you should be very, very selective. And I, I don't really recommend going in and listing a lot of books where you make one dollar. Or, or 50 cents, unless it's an e-score of 150, 180, it's selling every day and you can pick it up for very, very little, then sure, you can kind of do it. It's a slippery slope though, because if you list a lot of books and you're trying to make 50 cents, by the time they get into FBA, some books have dropped in price, some have gone up, right? But And then you're also never gonna sell all the books you send in, you're gonna sell 70 to 90% of the books you send in. So what you have to do is factor in, um, you know, for Scout IQ, and I think anybody should, they should look at stuff that sells all the time. You can have a very low floor. It could be a dollar or two dollars. If you're a bulk seller, I really still wouldn't advocate going much below a dollar. Reason being is the market changes. You don't sell everything. 
And you should probably toss that in a sell back your book bin and get 20 cents instead of maybe 80 cents down the road. Bill, you're welcome. Um, but seriously, it's not really worth the headache and, and I'm just trying to fill those up. Too many times we play the wrong game and the wrong game is total sales or how many books did I process? It's really impressive to sit here with books behind me. But if these are all books that are making me a nickel, who cares? I'm just a fraud at that point. I'm just saying, hey, I've got thousands of books and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm selling millions of dollars on Amazon and my profit is here. It doesn't matter what you make. It matters what you keep. And so, you know, restaurants, they sell lots of, you know, they, they're really good. You can get a, a really high, high end. It's not that hard for a restaurant to reach a million dollars in sales. But typical profits on the restaurant industry are in the eight to 10 percent range. So if you sell a million dollars in the restaurant space and you bring home 80, 80 grand after everything and then you got taxes on that, et cetera, it's not that great of a business. It's still good, but you're not going to get extremely wealthy, even though you run a seven figure business. So all that to say, my minimum MF profit is uh, it's right around the dollar. I'm kind of experimenting. I've gone to 90 cents. I, I play with a dollar and a quarter, but I pretty much let's call it a dollar. I don't really want to list it on the shelves. I'd rather put more expensive books back here. And I've got outlets to turn it into a quarter through sell back your book and some other players. So I'd rather just do that, move on and try and put more valuable stuff on the shelves. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Zach Price says, how are you listing and doing box contents when shipping LTL? A uh, number of ways to do it. Essentially, I list first. So I list in condition. Then I'm coming back scanning and doing labeling and box contents. You can do that through Acceler List, you can do that through ScanList, or you can do that through a number of entities, but that's essentially what you're doing. Um, the, the, what you don't really wanna do is do a live mode, because then you're gonna have to go back and rescan everything anyway and do it to box content. So I think it really makes sense to, to, to subject everything. I think you can precondition and just scan in speed mode on Acceler List. So I think it's a grade and list, and then it's a comeback, scan the barcode, print your label, you know what warehouse it's going to, and you can tell it what box it's going into. And so you get to kind of do labeling, box contents, and you're dealing with split shipments all in the second step. So that's kind of how we do it. Shout out to Zach since he, since he asked. One thing I'd recommend as well, guys, again, figure out where you add the most value in your business and focus on those things. And so Zach is a great example. He's, he's a really good dude. He's been in the book community for a while. He was actually... Correct. I don't know if you're an author or not. I should know this. We played a few rounds of golf, but you used to help market some authors and work in the publishing space as well. Um, so he's got a wealth of experience in the book trade and uh, him and his brother have kind of set up an operation where they're going in and uh, cousin, brother, I'm, I'm really bad at details. Sorry, Zach, but they're going in and, uh, and feel free to, to correct me if I'm incorrect here, but they're going in and they're running a CD and DVD consignment. So just like uh, Avery Romer, just like uh, Reezy, Mike, Mike Resendis, just like they're doing textbooks on consignment, Zach is doing DVDs and CDs on consignment. So I've got you know six, seven boxes I shipped out two weeks ago. I've got another two boxes coming your way real quick. And it's really important to partner with people that do niche things with the media. Reason being, when it comes to media, there's a lot of counterfeits, um, just like there are in the, in the textbook space, right? So there's, there's counterfeits. If you're not really an expert there, you can easily sell something and get your whole account shut down. So rather than deal with that, I'm gonna push that to an expert as well as he's got JFJs or Easy Pros. He's got some nice equipment to clean them and do all the you know all of that. And he he's streamlined to handle media. And so I just send, I don't get a lot of it, I send it to him. Sure, I could do it myself. Sure, I could try and make more money, but it's ultimately gonna be a distraction. So find people to partner. If those of you that don't have a lot of space and don't want a merchant fulfill some things, cool, sell it to sell back your book. Let them take the risk, let them do it. Find another merchant fulfilled seller in your area. And the other thing we do is, um, so I, I push media out to Zach. If you guys want, reach out on uh, Instagram. I'll, I'll, I'll connect you or uh, Zach, if you wanna drop your email or something, by all means, feel free to do that. I'm also working with an eBay guy, his name is Max down in Florida. I shipped out a Gaylord of really old stuff because I don't want to do eBay. I don't want to deal with Abe and Alibris and some of these other sites. And frankly, I don't have the eye for collectible stuff. But we come across a lot of old books and I know I've just thrown tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousand dollars away. Hey, I got some details. He used to be a book publisher. Brad is his brother-in-law. Yes, cool. So Zach, drop your email if you would or some way that people can find you, whether it's your Instagram handle and I will throw that up there as well. But I appreciate you. Let's get out to Vegas and play some more golf once uh, once we can. 
Um, but anyway, Max down in Florida, and if you guys want, hit me up on Insta or Facebook or, uh, or whatever else to let me know. We'll go from there. And uh, he, he, we're doing the same thing. It's 50 50 split. He's going to take a lot of my old books and hopefully turn them into money. We're already selling a couple hundred and two hundred dollar sets and a lot of 30 and 40 and 50 dollar books. So that's stuff that I was going to recycle, throw away, just discard or not even touch it. And if I can partner with someone that knows what they're doing, that allows me to set up my operation to do FBA and merchant fulfilled and just try and focus on getting more books in the door because that's where I'm going to make money as well. Okay. How is sell back your book profitable if all they get are seller semi duds? Good question. One, most of us, again, maybe that's some of my fault, but most of us sell FBA only. A lot of books like this, let's say that this is selling for eight bucks FBA and you know, seven ninety eight merchant fulfilled. Let's say there's no prime bump. The average prime bump or the median prime bump is about three dollars and fifty cents. The uh, the mean, the average is about five bucks. So most books, a lot of books have some sort of a bump. If they do, that's what gets routed to FBA. That's where our, uh, that's what you know. That's what we're doing when I'm making my decision. If there's an FBA prime bump, it goes in the FBA bucket. If there's not a bump, the fees with FBA keep going higher and higher and higher. Amazon kept them real low to start because they wanted a bunch of sellers to come in on the action. Now that we're here, they can just raise the prices. And if some of us say throw in the towel and leave, Amazon doesn't care. We're replaceable cogs in their mind, unfortunately. So this book, FBA, I might make. 80 cents. Let's say it's a $7 book and I'll make 80 cents after fees. I'm just guessing, right? Uh, Merchant fulfilled instead of 70 cents, which doesn't meet my criteria. I think I said 80, 80 cents, which doesn't meet my criteria. I need to make a dollar or a dollar 50. I'm going to then put it in my dud pile. Well, merchant fulfilled, it's not an 80 cent book. It's a dollar 80 or sometimes let's call it $2. So if you sold it merchant fulfilled and did media mail, you would make $2 on this book. Well, that would meet your criteria, but you say, Hey, I'm optimizing for FBA. Where sell back your book gets really fancy is they have really reduced shipping rates. I don't know exactly what they are, but they're not paying media mail rates. And so instead of $2 of profit and they're paying you a quarter, they're now getting $3 of profit because of that extra bump that they're getting. And they're also really smart and they're pushing books on their own website. They're pushing books on, on eBay and other marketplaces as well. And probably some non Amazon and non e-commerce sources. Bottom line, they're really good with books. They're really efficient. They can handle way more volume than I ever can. And so that's what they're doing, at least what I think. They won't really tell me because that's their secret sauce. So if I said anything I shouldn't have, I'm sorry, but I'm just guessing. What's your personal approach to controversial inflammatory topics? It causes some real conflicted feelings, whether to avoid spreading negativity or to hope or arming educators. Yeah, this is, a, this is an interesting one. Are there books that you will not sell? Everybody's got their own rules. In general, you know, you'll, you'll come across some, uh, maybe it's religious topics you don't like or political topics or sexual topics or uh, whatever it may be. There might be some topics that you just go, man, I wouldn't feel comfortable selling. If you don't want to sell it, don't sell it. Totally up to you. Um, I know that's a very millennial approach to that question, but if, you, if you're not comfortable selling it, don't sell it. Uh, ultimately, someone's going to buy the book and if, you know, you're not going to solve the problem by not throwing one book up there. But I have no problem with someone saying, eh, I don't feel right selling it. Let, let that emotion guide you and uh, that's okay. Late to the party, is this your warehouse? Uh, it, it's somebody else's and I'm just here, so be quiet. Don't ask too many questions. No, it's mine. Yeah, I'm, I'm leasing it for a monthly rate. How do I handle pricing quickly and efficiently with thousands of books? We're at 7,000 and are struggling. Get a repricer understand the limitations of a repricer and see how they work. Um, but yeah, at some point when you have an inventory of one book, you could totally reprice it every five minutes on your own and handle it. When you get to 10 books, you could handle it yourself. When you get to a hundred books, you can do it yourself. New price is a great tool. My business partner, Matthew came up with it. It's a great tool for busting through a couple hundred books, maybe even a couple thousand. As you run into scale problems, AKA lots of books, then you got to start figuring out how to get through them a lot quicker. So uh, repricing software is going to be that solution. I know some people that have said, hey, there's limitations to repricers. I agree. They can't see all the prime prices. There's some gaps and maybe you're not pricing effectively. I know guys that have outsourced it, found people in the Philippines that are willing to work for $2 an hour. They've set up their rules, given them account permission or access to Amazon and off they go. So that's an option as well. If you want human eyeballs and human decisions, you could set them up with, I think with new price, Matthew, correct me if I'm wrong. But I think you could set them up with new price. You could give them account permissions and let them into your Amazon account. 
Um, and you could give them the rules to go in and reprice and either give them the power to do it or to put them in a you know Google Sheet and then upload them yourself manually. So lots of options you can do. But at the end of the day, you either need cheap labor, which you can get in other countries. You can outsource it there where you know they're happy to work for that amount. They can have a you know decent quality of life in most cases. And or you can use software, which is tiny little ones and zeros doing your bidding for you. OK, what about donating the duds for tax write off? All right. Let's just talk taxes for two seconds, because this is always a fun one that we always get. I've got five books. I am going to sell this one on Amazon. I paid, let's say, a dollar a piece. I'm going to sell this one. It's worth some money on Amazon. So I'm going to donate these because they're worth nothing. What do I do? Let's say I let's say I do one on Amazon. I, I, I throw the rest away. Right. You got two options. As long as you're consistent, you have to kind of once you pick an option, you need to stay with this for all of your inventory. You can't just pick and choose. Option A is you say, hey, I'm going to take the total cost and put it toward the sellable books, meaning this Amazon book is now a five dollar book, not a one dollar book. What that means is I have zero cost in these. I can throw them away. I don't even have to deal with it. No, you can't write off all your costs here, five dollars, and then give these to Goodwill and claim that they're two dollars a piece. You'll get in trouble. Don't do it. So you can't write off more, even if there's fair market value, except in weird cases. But as a rule, you cannot write off more than what you paid for the inventory. That's just you, you can't fabricate things. You can't manufacture your taxes that way. So that's option A. Put all of your buy costs into your sellable inventory and then everything else is zero and discard of it or give it to sell back your book or, or give it away donate it, whatever you want to do. That's cool. The other option is say, hey, this is $1 because I paid a dollar for it. So that's my buy cost. Again, you can't expense it until it sells, right? I can't go on December 31st and say, hey, I'm, I've got $50,000 of, of taxable income. I need to you know, shelter some money or, or try and not pay taxes on 50 grand because I don't have money to pay taxes. You can't just go buy 50 grand worth of books and say, hey, now I have $0 because I just spent it all. It doesn't work that way. It's called cost of goods sold because you don't expense it until, surprise, the book sells. So it's the matching principle. You're supposed to match costs with sales. So option one, $5 book. When it sells, I write off $5. The duds are zero. I don't worry about it. Just get rid of them. The other option, option B, this is a $1 good book. When it sells, I write off a dollar. The $4 in duds, I dispose of, recycle, whatever you want to do, light them on fire, nuke them, throw them in the ocean, don't throw them in the ocean. Whatever you do with these here, you could actually write off the $4 right now. What that does is it actually moves the expense up and now you're expensing it today instead of expensing it someday when this book sells. That actually helps you. It accelerates your expenses, lowers your taxes in the short term. At the end of the day, when everything sells, whether it's this year or next year or the next year, you're still going to end up in the same spot as far as what you owe the government as it relates to inventory, but that's an acceptable option as well. So what does that mean if you've got a pallet of books and there's 800 books and you keep 200 of them and you're recycling the rest, you have the same option. You could say I paid $100 for the Gaylord and so my cost is $100 for 200 books or 50 cents a book and the rest are just zero and I, I discard of them and don't worry about it. Or you could say I paid $100 for 800 books and that gets us to about what, 12 cents a book? <sighs> I might have done that math wrong. I'm getting tired. I think it's 12 cents a book. And uh, now it's going to be, yeah, 12 and a half cents a book. So it's going to be 12 and a half cents a book on the duds times 600 books. I can write off that amount, which is going to be like $75, give or take. And then, you know, you're going to have the, the good books, about $25 worth. Either one's okay. Again, talk to a CPA, of which I am not and uh, make sure that whatever you set up, you're consistent, follow the same rules. Most bulk sellers do both MF and FBA. So merchant fulfilled and FBA. Your thoughts on someone doing bulk going 100% FBA? I've seen it, it can work. Depends on what your space is, depends on what you're optimizing for. Again, we get to pick our margins as booksellers. We can try and sell everything, right? Let's say these are duds that I've already scanned. Sell back your book doesn't want them. There's no value FBA or merchant fulfilled. They've never sold on eBay, right? No e-commerce value. These books still have value. Someone in my community will pay me for these books. Do I want to do all the effort to try and find that buyer to make a dollar or two or 10? Probably not. I want to optimize and get more books in the door. So the question is, it kind of depends. If Throw that question back up, Matthew, if you would. Um, you know, Your thoughts on doing ball going 100% FBA. The question is, how many books do you have access to? And I, I wish I knew your name. It just says Facebook user, so I apologize. Um, how many books can you get your hands on? Right. If you can get 100 Gaylords a week, 
no problem and the price is good and it's good quality books, you should absolutely skim the top of them off, take all the really good value for FBA and just move on. Let's say you don't want the overhead and the space and deal with merchant fulfilled and shelves and everything else. Cool. Keep your space really, really small. Keep it efficient. If things change, you don't have huge overhead. You can pivot quickly and just do FBA and go get more books. And you're going to optimize your system to get books in, get them scanned, get them listed and shipped out the door and just rinse and repeat. And the faster and more efficient you get at that process, you're going to blossom. You can keep very little overhead, very little space requirements. You're going to run a great business. Now, if you can't get 100 a week and you can only get two a week forever, right? Maybe you find more suppliers and go FBA or you start to say, hey, I can only get these books. I can't make enough money just doing FBA off of two Gaylords a week. I need to figure out how to scrape a little bit lower in that in that trench and get a little bit lower and try and eke some more value out. At the end of the day, anything, any book that we find has value to somebody. The trick is FBA is easy. Merchant Fulfilled is easier, actually, um, but it just takes more space and more overhead and more labor. Um, but at the end of the day, do you, how hard do you want to work to go lower and lower and lower? You should be selling the expensive books FBA. You should be selling the moderately expensive books FBA, most likely, and some of the cheaper stuff, longer tail, or when the, there's no FBA prime bump, probably goes Merchant Fulfilled. All right, we'll keep going. We're having fun. It's about three o'clock. I'm going to keep yakking for another 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll go from there. Junk Man says, can you grow a thick grizzly beard? I did. It did not look great, and it is now gone. So can I? Yes. Is it a good life decision? Probably not. TJ Benz. TJ, I think we met at Rakin's place, actually. I think you drove over an hour or two and dropped some wraps. Correct me if I'm thinking of somebody else, but... Uh, we did an interview with Rakin and TJ just started busting out this rap about spreadsheets and spreading sheets and it got weird real quick. And I think the look on my face was something like, I don't know what's going on, but well done, TJ. Is a gravel driveway an issue for receiving or sending pallets? Yeah, it's going to be hard to move them. If so, would laying plywood down be sufficient? We're talking, you know, 1500 pound Gaylords. So plywood, not a great option unless it's a very small span or a small stretch of, of, uh, of gravel. Uh, pallet jacks and 1500 pound loads and gravel driveways are not best of friends. So I'd be, I'd be cautious with that. You can get a forklift. It can handle that. And I believe a pallet straddler would, it's an electric version. Um, crown makes them, there's another name for them, but, uh, pallet Walker, I think that should get the job done as well. You can pick those up used for 1500 bucks to 2000 bucks as well. I uh, might've missed what I use to track expenses. I do two things. One is the tracking spreadsheet. I really use that for my inventory. Thanks, Matthew. The bookflipper.com slash track. It's a one-time fee and there's no monthly fees after that. You get to put all your expenses. It's got options to track outside of Amazon revenue. I really use that for my Amazon closed circuit environment. So anything I spend on, you know, direct Amazon expenses shipping to me, uh, I throw my labor into there. I put my, my books, uh, buy costs, and all of the returns and disposals and sales and you know everything else on Amazon, anything in the Amazon eco ecosystem goes through the tracking spreadsheet. Anything outside of that, let's say I take my team out to dinner, let's say I go on a business trip, I, uh, I use a business credit card, you should totally have a separate bank account. Aslo, A-Z-L-O is phenomenal, I love them. I wish they'd pay me to promote them because they're that good, but I'll just promote them anyway. A-Z-L-O, it's part of uh, Compass BBVA. Phenomenal, great online account, go get it, totally free. Uh, super easy to move money around. You can do uh, all kinds of good stuff with it. So check that out. But I use a business credit card and then I link that into Wave app. So you can use QuickBooks. I use Wave apps. It's free or just Wave. It's waveapps.com. Uh, they offer free dual entry accounting, which is nerd talk for it's really good accounting. Uh, you can generate income statements, uh, balance sheets. You can get a really good picture on your business, even if you're not an accounting nerd. Okay, what's your long tail cutoff for Merchant Fulfill versus FBA? This is kind of a fun one. And uh, Matthew, I've got one more call coming in. That's eh, Colorado. It's junk. Never mind. Um, this is an interesting one. So let's say a book in general, I would have said pre a year ago, I would have said um, you should probably do Merchant Fulfill. So I guess it depends, like most questions. If you're only doing FBA and you don't want to do Merchant Fulfilled, then you just have to have a firm cutoff. And what it is, is don't worry about this specific book selling, worry about this batch 
of book selling. So treat it like a stock market. I don't care about the individual stock. I just care about all the books in the long tail sector. And if one out of 10 sells, I just need to make sure that the profit on that one justifies the existence of the other nine. So for me, up until I started doing Merchant Fulfilled, the math on that looked like, and, and it's not just me, Jonathan Brown's got some pretty good data on this as well. He's in the groups. He's, he's a, an awesome dude. Um, very, very helpful, very, very knowledgeable. There's pretty much the FBA bump goes away somewhere between a million and a half and two million. So a book with a two million rank, even if it's got a $30 FBA offer and a $10 Merchant Fulfilled, I don't really care. I don't treat it as a $30 book. I think that bump doesn't mean a whole lot because it doesn't sell a whole lot. And I'm going to treat it more as a $10 book. Where Here's where it gets interesting. So, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, I would normally say once it gets north of like 2 million, somewhere in that range, I start looking at merchant fulfilled price only. This is when I talk price just because it's easier. Instead of profit, you can talk profit, same thing. A two million ranked book, I need it to be selling for at least twenty dollars merchant fulfilled, or have a profit of you know twelve or fifteen dollars. Three million needs to be selling for thirty merchant fulfilled. Again, I'm selling FBA, but I'm not looking at FBA prices. I think that it's deleveraged on the prime bump. Four million, forty dollars, five million, fifty bucks, all the way up. At some point, there is a hard cutoff ish. It's loosey loosey. If it's an eight million ranked book and nobody's on the listing, it probably is going to sell, especially if it's a topic that's relevant, current. You know, someone's going to read that book. If it's something on computers that's been, you know, completely outdated and no one's even even cares about it anymore. If you know some of these topics, then yeah, probably don't list it. If it's something that hey, someone's going to buy it once every three years, go ahead and list it. So that's the that's the rule. If you're just doing FBA, there's two schools of thought. If you're going to do Merchant Fulfilled as well, one is hey, if it's long tail and it's a fifty dollar book with a five million rank. I should just throw it on my shelf, no storage fees. It doesn't matter, you know, after a year, you're gonna get hit with long-term storage fees on Amazon that are gonna run, you know, 50 cents a month. I think they lowered that again, but it's gonna run you some amount of money and it, it starts to hurt after a while. Um, they're gonna start charging you monthly after 12 months in storage or in inventory. These shelves, I get paid nothing for it to sit there. I, I pay nobody anything. Now it's opportunity cost. What else could I list on those shelves? However, I can list it there. Here's where it gets interesting. FBA buyers are going to come along. And if you're merchant fulfilled and thrift books, discover, sell back your book and some of the other big players like Better World are on the listing, they're going to be competing and all your repricers are going to be moving around. And if you don't have a sophisticated strategy there, you're going to be third or fourth in line. And when someone comes to buy this book once a year, as they might do, you're not on the listing, you know, you're third or fourth in line. And unless your condition's better, your feedback's better, you have a really awesome description, you're probably not going to get the sale. Where it gets fun is those three or four merchant fulfilled players can all be fighting over the $30 price point within a penny or two. You can take your price FBA and instead of $30 and trying to beat them by a penny, just list it at $32. The FBA buyer is going to go, hey, I care about FBA. Ah, it's only $2 more, done. Or only 50 cents more, done. Maybe there's a little bump they're willing to pay. Cool. FBA actually helps you get that next buyer. So if there's not much competition FBA, it might be worth listing it. And maybe the reason the rank is so high is because someone would have bought it FBA or Prime and the book wasn't available and now you're making it available. Same thing goes true when you're when you're trying to list an Acceler list or somewhere else and you get the you know missing dimensions error. I love that one. It's annoying. I have to go back in and put dimensions and then go back and relist it. But that means no one sold at FBA probably ever, or Amazon just doesn't have the dimensions on it. That's cool because that means I get to be the first and probably the only for a while FBA seller on that listing. That's a good thing. I would rather put that FBA knowing that someone might buy my copy than go merchant fulfilled. So that's roughly the long tail. I'm not listing stuff, you know, rank goes up to 24, 25, 26 million these days. I'm not listing stuff over like 10 million as a general rule, unless I've got a really good spidey sense feeling about it. Is 200 bucks for a single Gaylord too high? The source separates Gaylords into two categories, children books and adult books, nonfiction, fiction, textbooks. Uh, try a couple. You know, if it's your last $200, then it's probably too high. If you've got $5,000 and don't mind taking a little bit of a gamble, try it. See what happens. Make sure you can measure it. Make sure you know how many books you're pulling out. I've got a source. We're paying 300. Uh, well, it was 350. Now we're down to $300 a Gaylord with a business partner. They're prepping and handling and doing it. And, uh, we're making our money. We're at least doubling, some cases tripling. Is that too much to pay? I don't know. Man, everybody's trying to call me, but none of it is 
freight, so it doesn't matter. Um, any rate, generally speaking, Gaylords are going in the fifth, you know, five cents a pound, so fifty bucks to you know, hundred fifty dollars. But if it's if they've done extra work and pulled the trash out, pulled non barcodes out, pulled old books out, they've made a better class of material. Try a couple, but again, if it's your last last amount of money, don't do it. You aren't mentioning IPI or sell through in the hypothetical FBA strategy. Good point, junk man. Junk man, you're on a lot of the calls. I, I, maybe I, maybe I'm sure I know your real name at some point. Let us know who you are if you would, or message me privately. Good question. Um, IPI now has to be above 500 to get unlimited storage. So that's another reason to do merchant fulfilled is it takes some of the risk away because Amazon could change that rule again. It was 350, then it was 400, now it's 500. Maybe next year we wake up and you have to have an IPI or inventory performance of 600. And that's going to be really hard to do for booksellers. 500 is pretty hard to do for booksellers. So if you want unlimited storage, you got to figure out how to get your sell through going. And that's going to be a, a, a function of getting books that sell quickly. Pay attention to eScore and making sure that you've got a good repricing strategy in place to be able to move your inventory. So that's kind of where we're at. Matthew, would you jump in? I think I heard a semi. I want to make sure I'm not missing it. I'll come back. We'll take another 15, 20 minutes to answer questions because we're having fun. I'll be right back. What's going on, everyone? I wish you could turn the camera there. We can see the actual shipment taking place. You guys can get a live demonstration of getting the pallet off the truck. Uh, let me go through some of these questions that we might have missed over and see if we can tackle uh, some of these. There's Caleb. <laughs> no, was there anyone? No freight. I'm just paranoid because it never shows up on time. <clears throat> we have a question about any quick tips for hiring a lister. This is something you kind of have just done a little bit, haven't you? Yeah. So I'm. My goal is I want to have the team here, be able to handle stuff so that I don't have to be here. I'd rather come travel and see you guys, and go play golf with Matthew. He's not really a golfer yet. We're gonna we're gonna win him over. But he's in a golf mecca down in Phoenix, so we're gonna. And it's an okay swing, a little bit of a sway. Um, we've got him in the Top Golf, so that's been fun. Um, anyway, I want to have my team here handling things, so I can be free to travel and prospect and go find more sources and work on the software. So you guys have really good tools at your disposal. Those things are are fun for me. I love business and trying to to, to grow mine and also grow yours. That's pretty rewarding. So uh, I want to have a team here that can handle things without me. So as far as hiring and where you should hire first, you know, you could try and hire someone to source. I love that. It's the most fun. You know, I loved running around and the thrill of the hunt at a, at a thrift store. That was great here in the ding, go off and finding good books. So I think listing is where you should hire first. And really it just depends or, you know, merchant fulfilled or FBA, you've got to get things down into just a, a very simple task list. And so it's, you know, what could go wrong, right? So they could mess up the condition that, means you get might get bad feedback you might get angry customers your returns go up maybe amazon kicks you off because you have way too many you know negative feedback so make sure they understand conditioning make sure they're really conservative and write out specifically if it's a library book it's only good or acceptable it's good if it meets this criteria for library books it's acceptable if it meets these don't list anything down here water damage excessive writing molds poop baby whatever uh, make sure you understand like so they they have those rules literally written out if you can't write the rules out or explain it to somebody they're not going to be able to follow it right so make sure you do the work up front to write out those guidelines and then find someone that's honest reputable will show up on time and uh, again if you can get them to move from listing 50 books in an hour and bump that up to 80 because you made the system really efficient and worked on their ergonomics and trained them really well that means you can now either pay them more or have them process more in the same amount of time, both of which benefit, hopefully both of you, pass some of that savings on to them. Top Golf Challenge, Las Vegas 2021, put your money up, chump. I don't know who that is, it just says Facebook user, but you're on. Vegas is a really nice Top Golf. I'm in, let's go. Is your beard real? Looks good, bro. I don't know if you can have fake beards. Is that really a thing? Do I need to pull on it like Santa? It's real, got some gray coming in. Michael Markison, this is 2020. Do not ask the question what could go wrong. Yeah, it's true. We're going to have to change the phrase. I know we like to say hindsight is 2020. I think we're going to have to change it to hindsight is 2019, something like that. I digress. Other questions. Gaylord, it's bulk worth it. We, we do roughly 100 grand a month with our sources, 
but I have interest in bulk. Are you doing a hundred grand in bulk books, non bulk books? There must be other products. If you're doing a hundred K in books and aren't doing bulk, kudos, you should be doing this webinar. I know there's guys doing it. Most of them are quiet because they don't want everybody else knowing what they're up to. But uh, congrats. That's a, that's a really big number. Hopefully you have good profit margins on that as well. But kudos, that, that takes a lot of effort to get up to that. Some interest in bulk. It depends on what you're doing now. Uh, do you have space? Do you have a uh, you know, good system in place? Do you have access to good quality labor at a fair price? It just depends. Lorenzo, what's up, buddy? Top Golf Challenger. Let's go. I'm in. He's in San Diego, so I guess you can uh, you can come on over to Vegas. Let's do it. What's a repositioner versus repricer? It's my own term. Matthew, go buy repositioner.com real quick. Uh, it's probably already taken. I don't like to reprice necessarily. Reason being is if you're playing, you come into a, a gunfight with a knife, right? Just like Indiana Jones did, except he had the gun and the other guy had the knife. When you go into a, a battle and you're trying to compete with the big players, Thrift, Discover, Better World, sell back those players, half price. They're gonna as soon as you reprice, they're gonna they're gonna change within a couple seconds, right? So they're using different software. They're using SQS notifications. There's software that'll do that for you as well. It costs a little more, and you have to be really buttoned up with your strategies. I don't want to play their game, right? So you can drop your price quickly, see what they do, and raise your price. You can kind of do that. There's probably a lot of room to be had to to run a really effective strategy there. For me. I want to just keep it nice and simple. And again, I'm measuring what am I listing every week? What am I bringing in? What am I selling percentage wise with myself through rates as a percentage of total books and inventory? And what's my ASP or my average sale price? I've got metrics I'm trying to hit based on the month of the year. Some months are slower than others, like October is usually slower. So if I hit my goal, I don't really care how I got there because I know that my business is going to spit out the desired cash that I need to live the life I want to live. So Repositioning, I don't want to reprice and chase everybody else. I want to reposition and be third in line, just like you do with Scout IQ. When you scan a book that's got an e-score of 151 plus, <coughs> I try to be the third FBA player. Whether I can see that or not in my software, if I'm using new price, I'm going to drop in roughly in that third spot and wait. And if it hasn't sold in a couple weeks, I go back in and off we go. Rob Knight asked a beer question. I should have known somebody looking at another dude. I'm just giving you trouble, Rob. What's up, buddy? I'll answer your text later, but I'm in the middle of something important right now, which is this. What's my handicap? I'm a 4.6. It's a golf question. I did get down to 3.4 this year, and I have beat Rob twice this year. Let the record show. Um, I'm, I'm drifting up a little bit. I did shoot a 70. I shot an 87 in wind and rain last week, an 82, and then a 78, a 77. So... It depends on which day shows up. Is the recycling market still bad based on tariffs? I think you're assuming you're uh, talking about China. China. I'm having a tough time finding recycling the bulk remnants. I'm not able to monetize. Reach out to me, Brian. There's a, there's a number of players buying recycling right now. It's uh, It did drop. It was negative in, in the, the yellow sheets market or the paper market. It's come back up a little bit. There's still some players that will buy it because, frankly, they're smarter at their bulk stuff than you or I are and they can make money off our duds. So reach out, there's thrift books, discover books. Some of those guys are typically buying material in your area. I learn a lot from Steve Eisenstein's radio show every week, you should do it again. I'd love to, I've been on it two or three times. Mom always said I had a face made for radio. I should get back out there. Uh, we did a YouTube interview, you can look it up. Uh, maybe Matthew can find the link there, but we did a YouTube interview and that was a lot of fun as well. Am I done doing textbooks? Good question, pretty much mostly. So there's a lot of counterfeit books. Let me just show you that. Uh, this could be a whole discussion. We won't get into it. Anything that says DSM-5 is probably counterfeit. This is the really popular one you're going to see. I don't list it. Um, I've got accounts that are restricted on these, and that's a blessing. I just don't bother. I've got accounts that I can sell it. What you should do is send it to Avery and let him sell it for you on consignment. And if it's counterfeit, he gets in trouble. Or Reezy, right? They're going to take the risk. The challenge is there's people doing test buys, and if they say it's counterfeit, they're going to charge you as much as they can, typically 1500 bucks to $8,000 in. They're going to try and find you and say, hey, you have to pay this or we'll sue you, or they'll try and get your Amazon account shut down. So there's risks involved in textbooks. I've had a call with them, asked them if we could get a list of books that they've deemed counterfeit so all of you could stay away from it. 
they declined. So at any rate, stay away from that. Um, as a general rule, if you're scanning with Scout IQ, we have the red R on the books over the, the, the cover that'll say, hey, it's restricted or commonly restricted. That's usually an indicator that there's been counterfeits in that space. That's a pretty good sign to stay away. Secondarily, if sell back your book, if it's a $50 book on Amazon and we flag it with red R and sell back your book is offering zero, that's usually a pretty good indicator. They know their stuff and stay away from those as well. So there's a lot of textbooks I'll still sell. Pearson's engage, it's fine. You know, the law firm I think is really out to get rid of the used book market because publishers don't make money on used books. They will adamantly, vehemently deny that, but I think that's really what they're after. And there really is a problem with counterfeit books, but that is a topic for another day. But there's counterfeit books, be careful. How do I add Keepa to the custom link on the Scout IQ app? Drop us a line, we'll walk you through that. Uh, support at scoutiq.co. Our team will walk you through it as well. Uh, we got some videos on that as well. Brian says, thank you. You're welcome. Um, have I considered splicing multiple buybacks into Scout IQ? Uh, we've played with it a little bit. Andy, I think we've got a demo call next week. We do have a, a little kind of Scout IQ on steroids. If you're doing bulk, it's a little bit of a premium tool. Uh, reach out to us. It's kind of an invite only just because it's really bare bones and really in beta. But uh, if you want to check it out, drop us a line, Caleb at thebookflipper.com. Yeah, we've toyed with it, but sell back your book is they buy nearly, you know, more books than anybody else from what we've seen. And it's a pretty good option. If you do want to see other players, especially on expensive books, tap on that book scouter link and you can go from there as well. Rob says I was battling two hernias. That's the reason you beat me. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Um, what else we got? If a book is really popular, it's better to sell FBA, right? Actually, if it's really popular, it's pretty much going to be selling at Amazon's price or close to it, like a book that's ranked you know, 50 or 150, it's selling tons of copies. What's going to happen is Amazon's on it for $15. That's going to set a ceiling. FBA is going to be like $14 and Merchant Fulfill is going to be $13.50. When you don't have that prime bump because you're running into Amazon as your ceiling, you're going to make more money merchant fulfilled and in a lot of cases you're going to sell it the same day you list it and turn it into cash so if the price there's not a big differential it's not that hard to do merchant fulfilled throw it in an envelope and get it out the door do you think keep is needed if you can use the graphs on scout iq depends on what you're doing do you just want basic data on if it sold and how much it sold for we got your back it's included it's our own data and uh yeah it's just as good as keepa if you're really into online arbitrage and want a lot more data, they've got some more bells and whistles and it's absolutely worth the 17 bucks or 17 euro or whatever it is. Michael says, thanks for helping others get an FBA. You're very welcome. Um, what other questions we got? And we'll, we'll let you go here. How does one find bulk suppliers? This one gets asked every six hours in the Facebook group, I think. I don't do bulk. I, I don't know. But uh, I would su suspect you could call any thrift store in your area, any library in your area, anybody that might have lots of books and ask them what they do with their books that they can't sell. And off we go. Someone says, would you offer a one-time special? I am listening right now discount code to purchase your tracking spreadsheet. Sure. Bonus 50, B-O-N-U-S five zero at checkout. There's a coupon code, the bookflipper.com slash track. Put in bonus 50. Doesn't matter if it's all caps or lowercase, B-O-N-U-S five zero. You'll save 50 bucks. How am I sourcing textbooks during COVID? Uh, I still do some e-flip, still buying a lot of books online. Uh, and so I, that has not gone anywhere and that's pretty good. Uh, I'm also working with clients directly similar to the Better World Books model where they scan the books for me and send me the good stuff. Sup homie, what's up? Is humidity gonna be a problem in your warehouse? That's a good question. I don't know yet. Uh, Colorado, I was spoiled because there's no humidity and books are gonna survive really, really well. We're not quite as lucky here in Indiana, although you know I suspect we'll get some dehumidifiers if it comes to that, and we'll see. If anybody's in a humid area, actually, I know some bulk guys in Michigan and, and St. Louis, so I'll reach out to them. But if you have any quick tips on humidity, let me know because, yeah, that could be a concern as we get into the summer. When's the next mastermind? Actually, Matthew was asking this here. We're supposed to be in Miami next week, RIP. Uh, we did one turn the page convention conference family get together, whatever you want to call them this, this year. And uh, then COVID hit and the world changed. So we have not done those. We want to be sensitive. We didn't want to make a bunch of events and have you being conflicted. 
I've been starting to travel again. We'll do some smaller meetups. Hopefully, Matthew can, can do some stuff. We're going to be in Denver in two weeks. Maybe we can do something small there. If you guys want to meet up for coffee and sit around socially distanced, that's totally fine with me. Um, but uh, we'll see. I think we'll start trying to throw those out there and people can use their own discretion and be careful. Thanks, Caleb. Successful purchase for the tracker. Awesome. Beers on you tonight. Appreciate it. Trying to see if we have anything else here. If I consider separate Facebook groups, one for beginners, one for more advanced. We do have a separate bulk book selling group. I think you can see that linked over from the book flipper group. It's a good question. I don't know where we draw the line. Do you have to show a screenshot of sales? Do you have to connect your Amazon account so we can verify your sales? Is it a years of experience? Is it a sales figure? I don't know. I'm open to it. You know, I know a lot. Our, our group's getting very large, which is great. I think there's 14,000 of you or so in our Facebook group, which is amazing. Maybe there's an opportunity to, to do something higher. I don't really like the idea of a paid mastermind group. That's just not, I know we make our money on software and books and I love giving the information away for free. Doesn't mean I won't charge for it. Matthew thinks I should. And so if you guys think, you know, whatever, maybe we could do that. But uh, I'd like to give Matthew some grief there. So uh, yeah, we could totally do it. I don't think we'd charge to be in it, but we could add one. We'll, we'll think about it. Uh, what else we got? That might be about it. What's up, Caleb? Not much, you? Um, do I have multiple listers? Yeah, we do. Do I pre-sort books in a certain way to, before listing? Yeah, we sort them into three groups. Acceptable, good, very good. And we leave them that way on the table in per, on purpose. So the very we have, our tables are just big enough. I think they're 36-ish inches, 30 inches wide. We've got the back row is always very good. Middle row is always good. Front row is always acceptable. And we do that so that someone can grade them and we let them, you know, we, we separate out those tasks. Shout out to Reezy. He, re he references, you know, when they do cars on the assembly line with Henry Ford, one person isn't going in and assembling the wheels and then doing the steering wheel and then doing the windshield. One person does one task and that's what we do as well. So books get loaded on the tables with wheels. Everything's barcode up. It gets wheeled into here. Someone's job is just scan everything as quickly as they can, separate it into our, our four money-making piles, then our duds and our type-ins. Actually, the type-ins get usually separated out, out there because they don't have barcodes. And then uh, we then take them from the wire cages, which I showed you earlier, and they go from the wire cages onto the tables in that order. And then someone's job is just to list. So listing is very, very quick. FBA, even though we're waiting for, you know, seeing where it's going to warehouse wise, we can really crank through typically 200 books an hour. Merchant fulfilled is lightning fast because it's already preconditioned. We list everything at you know 500 bucks and then repriced it later. Um, and so merchant fulfilled, we typically can push upwards of 300 books in an hour. And you know, that's, that's excessive. That's really fast. I don't know that I could maintain that for eight hours a day, but certainly for one hour, it's important to know your numbers and what you're looking at though. Anything else, Matthew? Otherwise we will get out. Uh, besides DSM-5, what other textbooks do I avoid? I've been around the block and I know a lot of books that tend to be counterfeit. If you just want to cheat, use Scout IQ. If it shows up with the red R, that's a pretty good indicator that it's blocked for most people. Those are ones you should stay away from. So for those of you that are gated or you know you can't sell popular textbooks, yeah, stay away. And uh, it's actually a, it's a blessing because you have less like less likely to be in trouble for selling counterfeit books if it ever comes to that. You can go check out, I think it's stopcounterfeitbooks.com. Just Google that phrase and it'll it'll pop up. I think it's that website. They try and explain things like looking at the glue quality and the paper quality. There's a lot of things that kind of make a book, even the way they smell, can be done a certain way. But uh, yeah, just research that, kind of be cautious and learn what you're getting into. I don't think you should stay away from all of them, but certainly there's some that are more uh, prevalent than others. Cool. Well, mm -hmm. I'm going to get one pretty real much, quick pretty much tip it, and then there. we're out. And then, Matthew, you can kind of wind it down. For those of you that use Bluetooth scanners, so you can use this just a Bluetooth fancy scanner. Looks like someone cut the cord off, but it's just a you know Bluetooth. These are great. Uh, I'm a big Opticon fan. Matt or Mike Kreider turned me on to the ring scanners. They're pretty cool. You can operate with one hand, lets you grab books and still, you know, kind of scan and do stuff. You can push it with your thumb and boop, boop, boop. There we go. I'm going to, you know, get you. Um, Bluetooth into phones. If you have a phone that's not super fast, so let's say there's a bit of a lag, probably the best thing you can do is most of these scanners nowadays come with these USB dongles. It's still going to be a Bluetooth connection, but it's like 2.4 gigahertz instead of, I don't know, some other nerdy term. 
Get a dongle, get an adapter. They make these adapters. I've got a, an Android phone. This is a Type C, so it's USB. So instead of plugging this into my computer, plug it into a dongle or an adapter. This goes into my phone. That's going to remove every single Bluetooth lag that there is. So that's pretty cool. Um, this will not slow you down. You can you know work across the room still. It's still going to pick it up. And if you want to get rid of that lag and just scan even just a little bit faster, there's my cute kid, by the way. Oop. There he is. Boom. Uh, if you want to scan just a little bit faster, check out the uh, the dongle method. We should write a book on that one. But anyway, I'd love to meet your Michigan bulk friend and other bulk questions. If that's a possibility. And that's going to be up to him. Um, but uh, yeah, guys, if you like this, we'll do it again some other time. Maybe we'll go interview a much larger bulk seller. Maybe we'll sneak in with undercover cameras to Bill's warehouse over at Sellbacker Books. That'll be fun. Um, See but, exactly what he's doing there, exposing. Yeah. How'd we do, Matthew? Were there uh, were there at least six people watching? There was at least six for most of the time. Sometimes we got down to like four, but no, we did good. I, I think we averaged from like 130 and 150 between the different channels, which is awesome. pretty cool to have all of you guys here for that. So thank you. Well, we've been uh, we've been a little under the radar with some some transitions and moves, and uh, you know Matthew's getting settled back in, trying to figure out a house in Arizona. <laughs> Otherwise, we I got tons of cardboard boxes, buddy, if you need them. But oh, thank thanks you. for uh, you know it's been a crazy year. Still got some craziness with the election and everything else going on, but we hope you guys are doing well, um, that your businesses are thriving, that you're thriving. We'll keep doing these. I know we were, like I said, quiet for a bit. We're back. Yeah. The weather gets cooler and my golf game becomes less often. I'll be doing these more often as well. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for giving us a little bit of your precious time. We hope it was valuable and we will catch you all on the flip side. See you guys.